Today, it's fewer than one in ten. Climate change is threatening the infrastructure we already have, and large chunks of our power network are reaching the end of the line. Yes, our fusty old country is in fact fast changing, and our infrastructure has to keep up. All our main political parties agree we need more infrastructure, and that we should pay for it through a mix of both public and private money. But how much is that going to cost? I've come to Oxford to see the economist Professor Dieter Helm, one of Britain's best infrastructure brains, for a frank assessment of how much we need to do. We've changed. And you can't simply expect Britain to roll forward 20, 30 years, add another 10 million people and say, well, you can make do with the roads we've got today and the airports we've got today and all the rest of that infrastructure. Right. If you wanted to put a figure on how much we should spend on infrastructure, what's the scale of it? I totted up the total costs of the commitments in government programmes for investment or government driven programmes for investment in water, energy, telecoms and transport. So no houses, no schools, none of those things. And I just added up the numbers and they came to a staggering 500 billion, i.e. half a trillion by 2020. Now, you have to let that number sink in. And it doesn't matter if it's wrong by 100 billion in either direction. It's still an enormous number. And it gives you a measure of the gap between the aspiration and the sad reality of the position we find ourselves in. What happens if we don't do anything? What happens if we just carry on as we are, don't take any big decisions? If we just stick our heads in the sand and do nothing, then it isn't going to be a pretty sight going forward and the British economy is not going to be uh, in a fit state to take on all those other countries which are confronting these problems. And uh, it's a process of gradual, insipid decline. That's the consequence of not facing up to the issues. You can see why a Chancellor wouldn't necessarily want to borrow heavily from the frazzled debt markets right now. But infrastructure's not all government spending. It can be public or private. What is true is that in the end, it's us who have to foot the bill, either as consumers or taxpayers. 500 billion pounds sounds scary, but think about it. Over 10 years, it's just a bit more than 3% of our economy. And spend it well, and it'll make your economy bigger than it would have been anyway. No, my point is, don't we need to spend more to give our economy space to respond to change, to give it room to dodge whatever punches are thrown at it, to keep it flexible. Above all, I should say, to allow it to respond to the changes that have always occurred and will occur to the nature of the economy itself. Here's the really tricky bit about infrastructure. None of us know what direction our economy will take in the next few decades, but we still have to prepare for it now. So we're bound to get a lot wrong, just as they did in the past. This is Kielder Water in Northumberland, the biggest man-made reservoir in Northern Europe. It's a beautiful part of the landscape of Northeast England, but it is just 30 years old this year. Back in the 1960s, there was no reservoir here, just a picturesque valley. The North Tyne Valley. Not pretty exactly, but abrasively beautiful in that unselfconscious northern way. But demand for water was rising, and there soon wouldn't be enough to feed the furnaces of the Northeast's factories. So they found the best site for rain catchment, moved out the people, and in the mid 70s, the diggers moved in. Right in my northern sky. 
the lake, seven miles long and four miles wide, will be bigger than Ulzer water. By 1982, it was ready for its grand opening. So, 20 years of planning, seven years of construction, and the reservoir was ready to meet the water needs of the heavy industry of the Northeast. Just one hitch. By the time of the recession of the 1980s, there was much less of that industry than anyone had expected. All of a sudden, this beautiful place was a white elephant. The world outside had changed even more quickly than the valley. Kielda is a monument to the way the British economy has evolved in recent times. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't have built it. You'll always get forecasts wrong. That's in the nature of infrastructure. Think of it as an insurance policy which didn't get used. Heidi Mottram is the chief executive of Kielder's owner, Northumbrian Water. My sort of feeling about that is, you know, this is a long-term game, water resource planning, you know, it's only 30 years. That's a blink of an eyelid, really, in terms of, I think, how populations grow and develop. So, yes, undoubtedly, that heavy industry did wane, but, you know, there may come a time when things change around, population changes around, you know, as we think about the way we want to use our country differently. So, I think you have to think of these things in terms of sort of hundreds of years, not necessarily 30 years. There is one other idea, isn't there, which is instead of moving the water down south, you could move the people up north. Well, that, that's one where I do think that we should seriously give that some thought. This is not only a very beautiful part of the country in which to live with a fantastic quality of life, but it can welcome, you know, the industries that need this resource. It can welcome additional population growth. And that's got to be, I think, a sensible, sustainable thing to do, hasn't it, to, you know, use the assets that you've got in the best possible way. The lesson of Kielda is that the world sometimes changes faster than infrastructure can. But that doesn't mean we should do nothing. Instead, we should appreciate that infrastructure needs to give us options. Room for manoeuvre in the future. A really interesting question to ask is, what kind of economy do you think we're going to have in 20 or 30 or 40 years' time? Are we really going to be able to survive on a service-based economy? Is the future just a bigger and bigger canary wharf? Is it just more and more large accountancy firms in the middle of London? Because if that's the future, then you should stick the infrastructure in the south and you should provide stonking good airport facilities, broadband, urban transport systems, etc., for all those city stickers that we're going to have in the future. If, on the other hand, you think that, that model has had its time, just like our old manufacturing had its time in the 60s and 70s, and we're going to move a bit back towards manufacturing, then you have to ask, well, what sort of infrastructure would that need? And here's the chicken and egg question. If you don't provide the sort of infrastructure that a manufacturing economy might need, you won't get one. And then if it would be self-fulfilling, you'll end up with a service-based London economy. So infrastructure isn't easy. Which sort of Britain do we build it for? And crucially, where? Do we try and rebalance our lopsided economy by building afresh in the manufacturing heartlands of the Midlands and North? Or do we lay on more and more in the southeast, where the population and the service sector have been growing fastest? Or are we content to do neither and have no options at all? No example sums up the difficult choices and our endless capacity to dither over them better than Heathrow. As we've moved away from manufacturing and towards services, it's played an ever bigger part in our economy. But we face an awkward question. Do we invest in more airport capacity in London or not? Before I tackle that, I'm going to get some hands-on experience 
of just how finely honed an operation a crowded airport like this has to be. Right, I've got my two high-vis table tennis rackets, ear protection, a 747 coming my way, and butterflies in my stomach. I've been entrusted with marshalling this 747 to the stand. That's 400 tons and around 350 passengers out of the 190,000 who arrive and depart here every day. No pressure then. You might not know it to look at me, but I've actually had a couple of hours training and my tutor, Simon, is watching carefully on. It's a stressful old business, but I did manage to get it bang on the center line, if maybe half a meter off its mark. The pilot gave me a really bad thumbs down there. <laughs> he really did. He looked very, he looked a bit annoyed. I think it's probably because we stopped quite suddenly. Simon. Evan. How did I do? How did you do? Well, for a novice marshaller, that was that was excellent. 400 tons in your fingertips and you've got it bang on the uh, the mark there excellent very well done it's very very important uh, to make sure that this aircraft parks on the correct stopping position because if he doesn't so they can't get the can't passenger get the passengers on. off passengers. exactly and the Heathrow's operating at 99.2 percent capacity as soon as an aircraft pushes back off of the stand another one arrives onto a stand there are people waiting to turn that aircraft around as quickly and as safely as possible and occasionally, planes are queuing up waiting for their parking space, really, aren't they? Correct. But provided that we have a, a blue, sunny day today, then everything should be working like clockwork. But thankfully, a good day today and very well done. That was really very, very good. Marshalling day is over. Most planes are now guided automatically to their stands, though some are still marshalled by the experts. The airport has seen phenomenal change in its 65-year history, and it's reacted to it in a very British way. Because whereas other countries have master-planned their big airports, Heathrow is a classic case of build-as-you-go. Civil flying gets going again, and Britain begins the fight for her old place on the skylines of the world. It was built as an RAF base and handed over to civilian use in 1946. That year, it handled 63,000 passengers from tents alongside the runway. Here a major air junction is being operated, while the buildings and runways are still growing up around it. By 1951, it was shifting 800,000 passengers a year and rising. It's managed to keep raising the number of passengers year on year because planes have got bigger and by gradually building bigger terminals. The architecture and interior decoration in this building provide an atmosphere in keeping with its importance as one of the greatest centres of international air traffic in the world. Today, it's still building, and it handles 69 million passengers a year, of no more runways than it had in 1946. That means the people who make this place tick have been forced to become ever more ingenious to get the most out of what they've got. The airport seems to build piece by piece. They've never quite finished it. And there's always something else going on. How does that affect what you're, you guys do? Well, it, that adds to the challenge and the complexity every day because it's like a big fluid jigsaw. All the planes keep coming and we have to find a space for them, but the picture keeps changing. Um, bits of taxiway are taking, taken away from us, so we have to walk around that, stands are closed, etc., etc. Give me some of the, the tricks of the trade that you guys use when you're trying to get the maximum use of the runways. It's not a first come, first serve basis. 
We get the aircraft and we shuffle them around at the runway to maximise the runway use. Mm -hmm. 